welcome to Coffee and Hard Tack, a new digital program from the Civil War Museum. Um, I'm John Edgington, Curator of Education at the Museums, and with me is Doug Diamond from the Museums, who's Manager of the Education Department and also the Curator of the Civil War Museum. Um, we are really excited to welcome our next guest, uh, David McKenzie from Ford's Theater. So David, thank you so much for being with us today. We're really excited. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Thanks for having me. Sure, yeah. So first, just you know, thank you. Thank you, Jen and Doug, for inviting me on this today. Um, so to, to talk with you all and the, yeah, the folks from Kenosha and from your, um, from your community. So yeah, so I'm, I'm David McKenzie. I work at Ford's Theater in Washington, DC as Associate Director for Interpretive Resources, which I then always say, that means exhibitions in digital history because it's a kind of intentionally broad title. So um, basically, I, yeah, I work, on, uh, work for Ford's Theater Society, which is the partner of Ford's Theater National Historic Site. So we, um, the two organizations jointly run um, Ford's Theater, and we um, part of the education department, so work with, work with my colleagues on um, programs and resources for people of all ages. Right. <laughs> David, for those of us here in the Midwest who may not have been um, at your site in the past, can you give us a, a rundown of the events that occurred at Ford's Theater on April 14th, 1865, <laughs> what you're best known for there? <laughs> Certainly, yeah, yeah. So of course, yeah, Ford's Theater is, Ford's Theater is most known um, as the site where President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on April the 14th, 1865, where John Wilkes Booth murdered him. Um, so really, um, you know, Booth, had, Booth had been plotting different things for about a year. Um, starting in 1864, he was actually looking to kidnap Lincoln. Uh, Booth was, um, he was from a famous acting family, white supremacist, pro-Confederate, and um, in 1864, the, the Union, the U.S., and the Confederates stopped exchanging prisoners. This was mainly because Confederates were massacring or enslaving African-American soldiers. So Lincoln and the U.S. government stopped prisoner exchanges. Booth had this, you know, really, it might seem like a harebrained scheme to kidnap Lincoln and take him to Richmond, ransom him for Confederate prisoners of war. This was also where you know, the Confederacy's manpower was really dwindling by 1864, and then with more and more in POW camps, dwindling even further. Booth had at one time made a promise to his mother that he would not take up arms, but he was, the um, scholar Terry Alford, who worked for 30 years on a biography of Booth, said he was a fanatic for his cause. And so he decided to basically take, um, take matters into his own hands, got together a kidnapping conspiracy in 1864, even a couple of times in late 1864, early 1865, tried to kidnap Lincoln um, both times that they um, planned to do it. Lincoln didn't show up at the place that they were, that they were laying in wait. So, um, but then you know, by early 1865, things are really changing. Um, April 9th, 1865, of course, Robert E. Lee surrenders the main body of the Confederate Army at Appomattox Courthouse. So this has really taken the Washington area out of danger. City um, breaks out into celebration and everybody wants to hear from Lincoln. So um, after a couple nights of putting off the crowds that had gathered outside the White House demanding a speech, on April 11th, Lincoln gave a speech, it was really a very policy heavy speech, um, talking about what to do with um, readmitting Louisiana. But one of the things that he says in the speech, for the first time, he goes on record endorsing some version, very limited version, but some version of African American voting rights. Booth is in the audience, and um, witnesses who were with him later reported that he said, Well, that means N word citizenship. By God, that I'm going to run him through. That's the last speech he'll ever make. Three days later, um, you know, Booth already has the motive. Three days later, he has his opportunity. He's an actor. 
very famous um, and knows Ford's theater very well. He performed on the stage there, even for Lincoln at one time. Um, Booth is picking up his mail at Ford's theater, finds out that Lincoln is coming that night. I mean, if Canada had picked up his mail, he probably would have found out because the theater owner publicized this left and right. But um, either way, Booth realizes, okay, this is his moment to strike. So on April 14th, he spends the day preparing. He rents a horse to facilitate his getaway. He um, even breaks a music stand and puts a wedge of wood inside the box where the president's going to be sitting. And he watches the play rehearsal. The play is a comedy, Our American Cousin. So Booth watches the play rehearsal to figure out at what moment there will be the fewest actors on the stage when there's a big laugh line, knowing that he could basically um, you know, use that as his getaway. So um, that night, Booth meets with a few of the conspirators from the kidnapping conspiracy and um, basically tells them, we are striking tonight and we are doing it, we are killing. Um, assigns George Atzrock to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson and he assigns Lewis Powell to kill Secretary of State William Seward. So essentially, the goal is um, not just to kill the president, but to basically lop off the head of the US government. Um, something to remember is that there were still Confederate troops in the field, um, still Confederate troops in further south in North Carolina, still Confederate troops in Texas and Louisiana. So Booth is, and the Confederate government's on the run at the time. They haven't been captured. So basically Booth is hoping that this will um, give the Confederacy another chance. So that night he shows up at the theater, the Lincolns show up at the theater, and around 10, just past 10, um, Booth goes to the president's box. President has sent a, um, has sent the police officer who accompanied him to the theater home and just has a messenger sitting out there. Booth hands a card to the messenger, goes in. And um, do, when the actor Harry Hawk is up on the stage saying a laugh line, Booth pulls out his gun, shoots Lincoln in the back of the head. There's another couple in the box with the Lincolns, Major Henry Rathbone, his fiance Clara Harris. Uh, Booth fights with Rathbone, jumps onto the stage. Booth is a, um, he's a 26 year old actor known for his stunts. So he probably figures he can get onto this, can get onto the stage pretty easily and get out. Might have broken his ankle there, some controversy. But either way, Booth manages to make it across the stage and he has set a horse waiting in the back. So he's out the door very quickly. And then um, pretty quickly, crowd inside the theater figures out what's going on and a doctor goes into the presidential box, declares that Lincoln's wound is mortal. And um, so the soldiers wind up carrying Lincoln out across the street to a boarding house that is sitting across the street. A soldier named Willie Clark is out for the night. So one of the other boarders in the house said, hey, there's an empty room back here, bring him on in. It's so basically they were trying to make Lincoln comfortable. And so Lincoln passed away the next morning at 7.22 a.m. inside the Peterson house. So that's a bit, bit of a sign of what, what happened at Fort Theater on, on, that, on that day. That, that was great because it gave so much context to it too, especially with Confederates still on the field and on the run. And um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. Um, I do want to ask, because I think Ford's Theater does a lot of great work currently about really talking about memory of the Civil War, memory of Lincoln, and in particular how people remember Lincoln and that night. Um, and you even have a really great digital component on your website that really reflects these um, primary sources of remembrance. So can you talk to us a little bit more about how people remembered the assassination right after it happened? Sure, um, yeah, so in fact, I will say the, bit, the big expert on this is Martha Hodes, who wrote a book called Morning Lincoln, which is um, 
really comprehensive account of people's reactions to the event. She also served as an advisor for our Remembering Lincoln website, which is what I was originally hired to create, that brings together people's reactions to the assassination. Um, but yeah, you know, really, it was, it was a really a pretty mixed reaction across the United States. Um, so give some examples from, from your region, in fact. Um, in Racine, the, um, a guy was basically tarred and feathered for getting up and saying, hey, this was not such a bad thing. Um, so, you know, a similar thing actually happened in, um, in Cleveland, where um, the mayor had, you know, called for an official morning rally, and um, an architect got up and said, well, you know, your day of mourning is my day of joy. That's no big loss. You can imagine how all the crowd reacted to that. Um, they basically ran the guy out of town, even chiseled his name out of the Cuyahoga County Courthouse cornerstone that um, he had been the architect for that bill. So his name is chiseled out because he got up and expressed his opposition to Lincoln. So, um, you know, it was really, you know, and also too, um, a lot of people really you know, use, you know, refer to events in their own lives. Um, for example, a West Virginia University um, public history grad student recently uploaded a few pieces from Salt Lake City where a Mormon church resolution referred to the assassination of Joseph Smith 21 years before that. Um, also, one of, the, one of the pieces that I, I find most interesting from, um, from the upper Midwest is, a, um, is a, a letter sent by a guy named Moses Many Lightning Face, was his, um, his name translated into English. Um, he was Dakota. He held as a POW in, um, in a camp near Davenport, Iowa. He had been one of the people who had originally been sentenced to, who the U.S. government had originally sentenced to death in 1862 at the end of the U.S.-Dakota War. Um, Lincoln allowed 38 of those executions to proceed, when I'm one of the most controversial pieces of Lincoln's legacy. Um, but then he also um, spared around 300 of them, but didn't officially commute their sentences. So he sent them to this POW camp in Iowa. So this letter that Moses Mindy Lightning Face wrote two days after Lincoln's assassination to a missionary in Minnesota was basically, you know, we've heard the president's been shot. What's happening to us? Because, you know, they knew that it was basically Lincoln personally keeping them from being executed. So, um, you know, also, like, you know, you had, you had a lot of groups who came out and said, hey, this was wrong. Um, so really, it was, it was really a pretty wide range of reactions. Um, on our website, we have around 850 reactions, and they really, they really run the gamut. Um, and some really surprising ones from, from different regions that you might not expect. So it's, I mean, it's, it's really, and I think what I, what I love about that part of the story too, is that you can really, you know, it really gets into a lot of different themes. You know, it really gets into, a, you know, really expands the story beyond the, you know, true crime, high drama happening in Washington to really see some of the complexity of the country as, as the Civil War was ending, as the country, would, you know, what shape would the country take from there? Yeah. Very interesting, David. Can you comment on how the Lincoln assassination and the funeral and the funeral procession across the United States that occurred shortly thereafter elevated Lincoln's status to what some historians call today his secular sainthood? Uh, can you comment on that? Sure, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is really, um, a part of it's really a coincidence in timing. Um, so Booth shot Lincoln on Good Friday. This is also um, this right during Passover as well. So um, two days later, Easter Sunday. So there were, were sermons across the country that you know really drew pretty explicit analogies between you know, you know, essentially Lincoln sacrificing himself for the country and Jesus sacrificing himself 
or even Jewish rabbis made the comparison to you know, Moses leading the people to the promised land, but not quite getting there with them. So, you know, the you know, part of this is a coincidence in timing. And then, you know, too, like, like you mentioned, Doug, the funeral train then goes across the country, um, starts in Washington, and um, you know, Mary Lincoln had made the decision to bury, um, bury her husband in Springfield, Illinois. And Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, made the decision to, um, to basically reverse the train route that Lincoln had taken to Washington in 1861 and hold funeral services in 12 northern cities. So millions of people showed up to Lincoln's funeral services and really were, um, so, you know, really the, this was you know, part of the beginning. Um, Richard Whiteman Fox has a great book, Lincoln's Body that really looks, looks a lot more at the Fox as a religious historian. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was really, you know, the, the experience for people of coming out to that funeral, of seeing this procession go by, um, really, you know, really made, made a pretty big impact. And too, again, I think that coincidence of timing. All right. Well, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that was a, a really good, very um, comprehensive. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we kind of talked about the upper Midwest reactions to Lincoln. I thought the Racine story was really interesting. So thanks for sharing that. Um, what is one thing that you uncovered or you learned while you're while working there that has really surprised you? Well, I think yeah, there, there's so much. Um, so I've, I've been at Ford State about six and a half years. Uh, in fact, I was originally hired just to do the Remembering Lincoln Project. And then my role has gradually just kept expanding. Um, <laughs> not a bad thing. And um, I, think, I think for me, just in general, the, I, found, I didn't realize just to me how interesting the story really was, how many things it could touch upon. You know, like I said earlier, it's, you know, oftentimes portrayed as a true crime high drama story, and it's yeah, it's political. I mean, Booth, you know, one of the things that really surprised me too is just how how relevant it unfortunately is today. You know, here at Booth, um, someone who's used violence to def to basically defend white supremacy, that's sadly very relevant. Um, I think too, and even one of the, Probably if anything that really surprised me was um, something I found last year when going through of all things an accession file at Ford's Theater. So, um, yeah, like we, we in the museum field deal with the accession files all the time. These are basically the files that you, um, you have about an, a particular object or about a set of objects that the museum brings into its collection. So, um, Ford Theater National Historic Site, the Park Service Entity holds the collection. Um, I was doing research for another blog post about one of the objects, and um, in fact, a question about the knife that John Wilkes Booth used. And I came across this letter from 1931 from the Adjutant General of the U.S. Army. Um, at the time, Ford's Theater was being um, refitted, the federal government was refitting Ford's Theater from an office building. It had become an office building after the assassination. The Secretary of War had the interior demolished, never wanted it used as a theater again. Um, it was being refitted into the Lincoln Museum. Now, in fact, a guy named Osborne Oldroyd had been running the Lincoln Museum, first in Lincoln's house in Springfield, Illinois in the 1880s, and then um, moved to Washington in 1893, and then and he had this whole collection. The collection was being moved into Ford's Theater in 1931. Or the plans were in place for that. And the guy who was running that operation, in fact, Ulysses Grant III, grandson of the general, sent a letter to the army saying, hey, you've got all of this stuff in your possession that was seized from the conspirators and used as evidence in the conspiracy trial, including the gun that Booth used to kill Lincoln. We'd like to display it at Ford's Theater. This letter that I found, the Army said no. The Army said, no, this is, um, you know, 
this is from a criminal trial, this was a murder weapon in particular, this should never be displayed. They said something about it would appeal to the morbid and weak-minded who were interested in the criminal aspects of the tragedy rather than the historical aspects thereof. So, um, so yeah, in fact, uh, appropriately nine years later, um, all of those objects were a new administration, um, turned over all of those objects to the National Park Service who had taken over the site. And um, the, the gun has been displayed since 1942. But you know, nonetheless, just see, seeing that, um, that there was that controversy then, I think really surprised me. Um, I also found it really interesting because some of us had been talking about, well, you know, what are the ethics of displaying a murder weapon? Mm-hmm. And um, so when I found that letter, I sent it out to some others. And my boss, Sarah Jenks, who's very creative, immediately said, hey, we should put that up on a sign right by the gun. So, of course, we appropriately unveiled that with a link to a survey 10 days before we closed. So we haven't really gotten much reaction to it yet. But nonetheless, I think that, I think that was really a thing that really surprised me quite a bit was just, you know, too, just, you know, again, going back to the, the memory piece of, hey, you know, some people said, hey, you know, this 70 years was too soon to display that weapon, essentially. That's really fascinating. Um, yeah, because I David, think David, I was at your site a couple years ago. Go ahead, Doug, you cut out, sorry. Did you lose me? Or did I lose? A little bit. I think we, yeah, we just left. For a second. Um, oh, yeah, it's fascinating. David, I was at your site. All good? Can you hear me? Dave? I was oh, at your site hear. a couple years ago, and um, <laughs> I it was you. the first time I'd been to the Peterson house. Now we're good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went to your site uh, on spring break a couple years ago and went over to the across the street to the Peterson home and saw the new exhibits there. And the, one of the final things that you do as you, as you come through the exhibits is you spiral down through all of the literature that has been written on Abraham Lincoln or the assassination of him itself. Aside from coming to the site and making a personal visit to Ford's Theater or checking out your, your website, can you give some recommendations for people if they want to learn more, maybe a personal favorite of your own, um, something that you go to for your research that um, people would find interesting if they want to learn more about the events of that evening or, or Lincoln himself? What can you recommend for us? Certainly, yeah. Well, there's, I mean, you know, as you know, there's, there's a lot of books out there. But um, in fact, the estimated 14 to 15,000 books about Lincoln. But a few, few of my personal favorites, um, one thing if you want, you know, especially the assassination story, um, James Swanson wrote a book called Manhunt that is, um, it really reads like a novel. <laughs> and it really gives you a lot of, you know, really gives you a lot of the facts of the event, talks about some of Booth's motivations, um, you know, really well done. Another one um, that I mentioned earlier is Morning Lincoln, Martha Hodes. She's, um, she's an amazing writer, for one thing. Amazing historian has done it, you know, did a ton of research for this, and you know, really, really writes beautifully about how people reacted and what that says about the U.S. at the end of the Civil War. Um, well, Richard Fox's Lincoln's Body is a, another great one that really takes, you know, takes the Lincoln legacy up through today. Also, if you want to know more about Booth, um, Terry Alford wrote a great book um, called Fortune's Fool. He um, spent 30, in fact, spent longer than Booth lived researching him. I um, spent about 30 years on this book because uh, Booth, was, um, Booth was the type who he spoke a lot more than he wrote. So Alford traced down, like literally um, for one of Booth's performances, he talks about this 14-year-old boy who um, went to the Boston Latin School, wrote about it in his diary. Wow. So, yeah, those are you know, just a few recommendations. But, I mean, there's, again, there's really a lot out there. There's especially some really great scholarship in the pipeline, too, for, um, you know, for the Civil War and Lincoln himself that really expands the story even further. 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. We really appreciate you taking time to come talk to us today. Thank you. So we really appreciate it. We hope people will visit your website and then when you reopen, fingers crossed soon, right? That they come visit you. So thank you so much, David. We're so happy that you you came and joined us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and you know, keep up your great work there as well. And we'll look forward to future collaborations. Sounds like a plan. Well, thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you soon.